The Olympic Peninsula's outer coast is a place of dramatic beauty that showcases the awesome power of the Pacific Ocean to shape the raw, rugged edge of North America. Winds here generate upwelling that brings nutrient-rich seawater from the depths of the Pacific to mix with the outflow of the Salish Sea. This creates a fertile food web that nourishes everything from plankton to top predators. Team SeaDoc has traveled here to La Push, Washington, on an important mission to study some of the endangered species that depend on this complex ecosystem. This is not, however, the easiest place in the world to do research. Our field work this week has us operating where the waters can be so treacherous that the brave men and women of the local Coast Guard station use boats specifically designed to handle 30-foot seas and to roll themselves upright if they capsize. These waves, some spawned in huge storms thousands of miles away, batter and chew up the shoreline. The process of differential erosion leaves behind islands, reefs, and spectacular formations called sea stacks. Over the centuries, towers of sandstone like the Quileute Needles have become isolated from the mainland. They now serve as natural fortresses for birds seeking nesting spots free from human disturbance and safe from predators, at least from those predators without wings of their own. When we arrive at La Push, part of the team heads out on a scouting cruise captained by Chad Norris, a biologist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Also aboard is Dr. Nacho Vilches, Associate Director of the San Diego Zoo's Recovery Ecology Program. Nacho was previously on staff at SeaDoc and was lead author on our groundbreaking study that showed that birds in the Salish Sea who make their living diving for forage fish are 16 times more likely to be suffering population declines than other kinds of marine birds. We begin to see birds as soon as we leave the dock. There are plenty of gulls and cormorants on the sea stacks but the birds we're looking for are more likely to be either out on the water or out of sight attending to their nests. The combination of productive fishy waters and protected nesting habitat make this area a paradise for the kinds of birds we're hoping to study. Members of one of the coolest feathered families in the entire animal kingdom, the alcids. Here's our first alcid, a rhinoceros auklet, named for the distinctive white horn it sports as part of its breeding plumage. These pigeon guillemots are also alcids, and we get a good look at the family's typical body shape, which has been described as a flying potato, with their feet set far back under their rear ends so they can act as rudders while diving. The alcids are not very graceful on land. They won't win any awards for aerial acrobatics either. Their stubby wings mean they have to flap fast and fly straight, and they often need a web-footed running start just to get airborne. But they can fly which is an amazing ability for a bird that has evolved to flap its wings underwater and fly through the sea with enough speed and skill to catch fish. Alcids are also sometimes called the penguins of the north because both families of birds exploit the same hunting strategy. This one is a tufted puffin. This charismatic bird looks like a cross between a penguin and a toucan and is the most colorful and iconic of our local alcids. Unfortunately, at their present rate of population decline, these beautiful birds could be extinct in our region within just four decades. These are marbled merlets, another remarkable species of alcid that along with the tufted puffin is one of the two endangered species we're most interested in studying on this expedition. Though creatures of compromise, the alcids can swim deep into the ocean, more than 500 feet down in the case of these common mers while also retaining flying skills that penguins can only dream about as they waddle across the ice. So they're definitely worthy of a better nickname than flying potatoes. We think that their combination of astonishing powers makes alcids the superheroes of the bird world. To collect the data we need to help conserve these birds, we're going to have to temporarily capture some of them. We don't want to disturb nests, so we'll try and catch them while they're out on the water. That's nearly impossible during the day when they can see us coming. This means we're gonna to have to do it in the dark. The charts show that a couple of the spots we'll be visiting in the middle of the night include Jagged Island and the Giant's Graveyard. How comforting. This is gonna be wild. 
outer coast weather can change from bright and sunny to soggy and soupy faster than I can change my socks. And that's just what's happened. After working through one sleepless night with no results, we're now forced to hold at the dock due to heavy fog and high winds. Unfortunately, this rough bar isn't a watering hole where we can pass the time while we wait. It's just a reminder of the potential dangers lurking outside the breakwater. Oh, here's another good omen. We're hoping that this isn't the remains of the last scientific expedition that came here. No one has gotten much rest today. Even the local river otters seem exhausted by our work schedule. Finally, the conditions let up just enough that we get the okay to try again and we prepare to head out. When you study seabirds, you have to go where the birds are. Today, we're in a tough spot. You see the fog, you can hear the wind, waves are picking up, and we're going out at night. So we're here with a big team. We're here with people from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, University of Puget Sound, and of course, Team Sea Dock. And as you see behind me right now, we have a whole cadre of boats. We have a mothership, and we have multiple capture boats that we'll be going out on tonight. The mothership was christened the Fog Lark, not because the fish and wildlife folks think it's a hoot to be out in the fog, but that's the name that woodsmen once used for marble merlets, the most mysterious and particular of all the alces. We have different permits and research objectives depending on which species of alcid we encounter. So each crew member on board is assigned a specific task. Dr. Peter Hodum, a seabird ecologist and conservation biologist with the University of Puget Sound, will join Chad and Nacho in a Zodiac as Capture Team 1. Sea Docs Bob Friel and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife biologist Kelly Beach and Elisa Weiss make up Capture Team 2 and the other small inflatable. As we cruise along the sea stacks at last light, we spot quite a bit of bird activity. Hopes are high that we'll make a capture. Sue Thomas from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Sea Doc's Justin Cox, and yours truly, will stay aboard the Fog Lark, prepared to gather data and apply satellite tags to any tufted puffins the teams might catch. And of course, like any good mothership, we'll also dole out snacks to keep the crews going all night and triple check that everyone's wearing all their safety gear. Once we're anchored in a promising spot near the now invisible sea stacks, the capture teams set out. Aboard the small inflatable boats, one person handles the outboard, the GPS, and the radio, while the other two perch atop a large cooler, sweeping spotlights back and forth across the water to look for birds. The idea is that when a seabird is sighted, the captain will speed up and aim for the target why one spotter keeps both lights on the bird to momentarily disorient it. The other spotter lies across the bouncing bow with a hoop net ready to try and scoop up the bird before it dives out of reach. All of this takes place in dicey conditions with big swells, bone chillingly cold water and thick fog on a pitch black night surrounded on all sides by hazardous rocks. Sounds like a piece of cake. Hours go by. The mist drops and lifts like a curtain, at times severely reducing the range of the spotlight and playing tricks on strained eyes. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. There, I think it's deceiving though. I don't think it's actually as close as it seems. The crews detect some of the hazardous rocks and reefs only by sensing a change in the ocean swells or when they suddenly hear waves crashing close by in the darkness. A nerve-wracking sound that's way better than caffeine for keeping you wide awake and alert. At one point, the only thing showing on Elisa's GPS screen is a warning that says, Danger Area. From then on, Team 2 is forever known by its new call sign, Danger Danger. Dingy. That's our new name? That's it. Danger, danger Dingy. dingy. Just after 11 p.m., the radio sparks to light. Team one has captured a seabird. Okay, copy that, we'll do. Um, so we're, uh, we're <laughs> off Alexander Island on the outer coast of Washington. It's about quarter past 11. We've just caught a marble merlet. Uh, we have it in this carrier beside me. Um, and our, our intention is to collect a, a poop sample. This is awesome. Marble merlets, which biologists nickname mammoths, are the most secretive of all the alcids 
and the most challenging to study. This is only the second one so far this year to be caught in Washington State. To ensure the bird isn't unduly stressed, we start a countdown. It must be released within 30 minutes. Our highest priority is to collect that fecal sample though, and some things you just can't rush. Chad takes over poop patrol and monitors the merlet inside the pet carrier slash mamu porta potty. This is the glamorous part of field biology, waiting around for a bird to go to the bathroom. The fact is though, if we can get a dropping before the time runs out, it will provide extremely valuable data. Success, what a relief for both the bird and us. Marble merlet populations in Washington state have declined by more than 44% since 2001, and they're being particularly hard hit inside the Salish Sea. They're not reproducing well, and researchers believe that one of the major issues is that they're not finding enough high quality food. DNA from our poop sample will tell us exactly what this merlet has been eating. Nacho and Peter use the extra time to gather measurements to add to our general knowledge of the species. When an alcid can't locate oily, energy-rich forage fish like anchovies and herring, they're forced to feed on less fatty fish such as sand lance or even on zooplankton like krill, which doesn't pack much of a caloric or nutritional punch when you're trying to survive and feed a hungry chick. It takes about 80 krill to equal the value of one sardine, which means these pursuit divers can wind up investing a lot of energy for very little return. Peter takes a few small feathers from its mottled chest. This is to continue a fascinating study that measures the ratio of stable isotopes to determine how high in the food chain the merlets have been feeding. Results so far are disturbing and point to a reason why we're losing our mammoths. Put into human terms, back in the day, marble merlets were feasting on prime rib, while now they're often forced to get by on Twinkies. Energy budgets are particularly critical for marble merlets because of their unique life history. Unlike other alcids, the mammoths don't nest out here close to their feeding grounds. And one of the most extraordinary breeding strategies of any animal, merlets lay their single green and brown egg as far as 55 miles inland. And since they're much smaller than their relatives, the puffins, these little half-pound birds can only carry one forage fish at a time as they fly up to 60 miles an hour, their little wings flapping furiously as they head back to the nest. When you're making a 100-mile round trip to feed your ravenous chick a single meal, it better be a good one. When there aren't enough high-value forage fish around, all that the parents are able to find is krill, there is no chance their chick will survive. To make their existence even more tenuous, these birds prefer to nest in the high mossy branches of old-growth trees. This basically makes the marble merlets the salmon of seabirds, because their survival depends on us protecting and restoring both the marine and inland forest ecosystems. The fact that these magical little birds are still hanging in there for now gives us hope that we can save enough of their habitat and time. And it's all the evidence we need to indeed consider them the superheroes of seabirds. Bye-bye, birdie. Love to you. Thank you. Well, that's good. That was good. The coolest thing was when we saw a sea lion zipping around the boat and it was sparking up all the bioluminescence. You could see the trail and it was going underneath the boat, around the boat, so close to us, just within a couple feet. And it looked like a trail of sparkles coming behind the sea lion. You could, it looked like a pathway of stars in the water.